Um, cool. Okay, so the agenda today. Um, we're going to look at features that were added in Airflow 2.2 plus roughly. Um, we're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to talk about the big ones and maybe a couple of little ones um, that I think are noteworthy. The, the goal of this isn't for you to be totally comfortable with all these features, but just so that you know that they exist, you can go find the docs and you know take advantage of these features in your DAGs. Cool. So we'll get started with deferrable tasks. Um, so this actually came out in uh, Airflow 2.2. It's been out for about two years now. And when it, when it first launched, it was pretty slim. There was only a handful of operators that you could use uh, with it. But over the last two years, there's, there's really a lot more now. Um, this feature really unlocks better scaling and resource utilization. Uh, any, any task that you have that uses an external system is a perfect candidate for using uh, deferrable operators. Um, you don't lock up a worker slot for the whole duration of the task. So if we look at it this way, right? We have a normal task that can start up. It can hit a point where it can pass off and go, you know, let the external system do, do some work. We can have a lightweight system that we call a trigger actually keep tabs on that thing. Um, and then eventually it can come back to a normal worker to do, you know, normal cleanup things. One of my favorite operators in general, but especially for deferred work, is Kubernetes pod operator. Um, this is a perfect example of start something, watch it for a while, and don't do anything really interesting while watching it, and then do some cleanup. Um, this is a, a, a perfect one to, to, to demo here, um, but I'm not gonna demo it, actually. I'll the nice thing about the, a lot of the deferrable operators now built into open source providers is you can just turn the deferrable behavior on with a, a simple keyword arg. So let's take a look at like how this would work if I were brave enough to run a demo. Um, Kubernetes executor is a great way to kind of visualize this because each task gets its own pod. And so what we're seeing here is actually the Airflow worker pod that Kubernetes executor is spinning up. And so what we see here is at first, we get one worker, it starts, and then it completes. Those dots is where the trigger takes over. That's that async part. And then eventually it comes back around once that task pod is done and does the cleanup stuff. So there was, I actually sat down and was trying to figure out how many operators now supported deferrable mode, um, but there's a lot. Like every major cloud provider, I think every single major per open source provider now has deferrable support of some sort. Um, we've actually hit a point now where we added a new config flag to turn on deferrable mode by default. So if you're running Airflow for your company and you don't want to refactor a bunch of DAGs to um, turn it on piecemeal, uh, you can do it all in one go. Okay, so it's cool to have deferrable mode built into operators, but what about custom operators or sensors? Um, the interface actually to implement this isn't all that bad. So if we, I don't know how many of you have written, actually written a custom operator, but that's our normal, you know, friendly execute method. Um, there's now a self defer, which you can call in any, any execute method. There are a few things though that you have to give it for this to actually work. Uh, the first is a trigger, um, and we'll talk a little bit more of what a trigger is um, in a minute. Um, and then we also tell it where we want it to resume, right? So remember when it came back around, it has to know, Airflow has to know where to pick up execution from. Uh, kind of the convention today is execute complete, but um, you can have it come to execute again. You can use whatever name you want. Um, now the trigger side is actually where it's a little more interesting. There's a few things that you have to do. Um, one is you have to have a serialized method, and this is simply just a way for the trigger, or sorry, for Airflow to be able to re reconstitute this trigger on the trigger. Um, and then the more interesting one, and maybe one that's a little less like familiar in an Airflow context, is your async run method. Um, this is a really simple example that will just succeed immediately, right? But you can imagine here that you would eventually do, uh, 
you know, some sort of async process to, to determine when you're ready to resume work. Um, it's really important to make sure that you do only async work in this run method, because if you do sync work, you will block every other trigger on the trigger. Um, and I think by default, you can have a thousand on, on a trigger. So important to uh, make sure you only do async work. Cool. Um, on to the next one, dynamic task mapping. So this one came in uh, Airflow 2.3. Uh, this is more of a, a DAG author level um, feature. Basically, it's a way for you to have a task that operates on a, a set of things uh, in an in a easy, insane way. Uh, you can kind of think of it as like a, a for loop for your task. Uh, this is Airflow's map reduce kind of at the end of the day. Um, so why shouldn't we just do it like this though? Like let's look at the problem it solves first. So if we just toss this into our DAG naively, right? We have a for loop and it calls an operator. Um, I mean, it would work until we change what the bucket list looks like. And then we don't even need to have a DAG run and our history changes. Airflow parses DAGs constantly, right? And so the, like by default, potentially every 30 seconds. And so you're changing the DAG shape every single time the output of that S3 bucket changes. And uh, you know, you don't lose, you, I guess I should say you lose easy visibility in the history. It's still there if you want and like looked at the task instances directly, um, like they're there, but I mean, we don't wanna see them just kind of disappear like that. So enter dynamic task mapping. So instead we can have the concept, or essentially what happens here is you can run your list during DAG runtime and then have an operator expand off of the output of that initial, the, that first task. So in this case, right, that list file names, um, that's run during runtime. You know, you can have one, you could have five, 50, it doesn't matter how many you end up returning during that runtime context. Um, Airflow is going to keep it all straight for you. And so if we compare that with the last example, right? Here's our first run that we have five. And I guess I should highlight, you can see kind of where the intersection of the blue is on that, that grid on the left. So that's that first run with five and then the next run with, with three. We don't lose any, we don't lose easy visibility into our history. Now the reduce portion. Um, you can take the output of a map task, which is what we have highlighted here, and then pass it into an aggregate task. Uh, so sum is, you know, the classic example of this. Uh, yeah, this is what the, the graph would look like. Um, you can see that it, you know, had two. This is a specific run of this DAG two and then the sum. Um, we're just kind of scratching the surface of dynamic task mapping here. There's a lot of other features here. Uh, it, it's grown over time even. You can now map over whole task groups. You can do filtering, you can zip things in. Uh, lots, of, lots of cool things here. So yeah, if you guys aren't already using this feature and not aware of it, definitely recommend checking it out. Cool. All right, let's talk about dynamic DAGs. First, I wanna talk about this feature though, is auto registration. Uh, it, it came in Airflow 2.4. Um, personally, it's one of my favorite features. Uh, if you're using the DAG context manager, you no longer have to work to get the DAG into globals. So the way Airflow discovered DAGs pre-Airflow 2.4 was to look through globals to find any DAGs. Right? And so you'll find some old tutorials and stuff that advise you to do this. But with Airflow 2.4, you don't need to do that anymore. It just happens automatically. And you're all happy. I like this. I don't, I don't write dynamic tags very often, but even just getting rid of that as DAG for some reason is a very like pleasing aesthetic to me. Um, so yeah, you can chop that too. Okay, well, let's talk about dynamic tags a little more loop over it and build a DAG, easy. Um, but the problem is, is this pattern 
works really well when you're experimenting and like first de defining how you want to build your DAGs. But over time, it becomes unwieldy, right? It works great with a few DAGs. Once you start getting into hundreds, uh, you start feeling some pain. Um, ignoring like debugging complexity and things like that, at the end of the day, you have to build all of the DAGs to run one task, right? That's the first thing that Airflow does when it goes to run a task is it, it builds that DAG. And that's not ideal. So what we can, oh, sorry, I had some highlights there, yes. So what we can do instead is the concept of the magic loop. Um, so Airflow can help us here by giving us a little context, going, hey, do you, do you want all of the DAGs or do you just want a single DAG? Uh, in this case, we're just going to look at the DAG ID. Hey, do like what DAG are you looking for, Airflow? Um, if you're looking for my DAG, then we'll parse it. If you're looking for all DAGs, we'll parse them all. But this lets you kind of short circuit and only build the DAG object that you need when you're running a specific task. Now, this isn't, I view this as more of like a, a stopgap, at least personally. Um, if, if you've hit the point where you need magic loop, you probably should refactor away from a loop for your dynamic DAGs in the first place. Um, yeah, because you're, you're still having the downsides of dynamic DAG with you know parsing them all in one file in the parsing context of Airflow. Um, yeah, so keeping things simple on your DAGs is always a, a good thing. Cool, we'll move on to data sets. Uh, yeah, so Data sets is, uh, it's kind of, it's a building block, uh, and that's still true today. You probably heard this morning that um, we have the foundational piece done, but it definitely needs more work, uh, but you can use it today. Uh, so, data where scheduling, what, what are we talking about? So, what we mean here is, it, it's, a, it's a new way to have a DAG be triggered. So, instead of having a, like a, DAG that's scheduled on a fixed schedule, right? You tell it, I want it to run every, every day at 2 a.m. or whatever. You, we now have the ability for a task to say, hey, when I run, I create data set X. And then you can have other, ta other DAGs that, that aren't related to that original task at all say, hey, whenever data set X updates, I want to run. How does this happen? So on the producing side, you, you add an outlet into your task. And you can, you can do more than one. Um, but in this case, we're just going to add the one. We're going to call it data set and you know, whatever S3 file. Um, before I move on, though, I just want to mention the, the data set concept is built around URIs. Today, the URI is just use as a unique string. Like there's no meaning, like this says S3. Airflow does nothing S3 specific with this. Uh, Airflow is just as happy if you had hello here. Um, that may and it will change over time. Um, so if you're coming to us in the future, uh, this may not be true any longer. Um, yeah, cool. Let's go to the other side, the consuming side. Pretty similar. when. You want it to run, you go, hey, schedule equals when this data set updates. Pretty simple. In the UI, we see when's the next run? Whenever that file updates, or I guess I should say whenever that data set updates. Um, there's also a cool UI view that is, um, it's the data set view that helps you visualize these relationships. All right. So, what happens in the case where we want to look at more than one data set? Uh, and this is admittedly a little bit limiting in today's Airflow world. Um, but yeah, what happens? So in this case, Airflow waits until every data set has an update. So in this case, X can update three times and the DAG won't run until data set Y has a run. So you can, and that, and it's it's important because, especially if you want to have any details about like what those parent runs were that updated that data set, it can be many, 
And so like the range, like you have to, you kind of have to deal with that, uh, uh, as, as the consumer. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the behavior currently. I imagine this will end up changing as well. Um, and cool. When we, when we do end up with multiple data sets, we can see it this way. Um, and then there's also a modal once you click that little button that will give you a little bit more detail as well as to uh, the state of your next run, how close you are. Cool. Set up teardown. Um, so this is the this is the newest feature for sure. It just got launched in 2.7 like last month. Um, this is going to feel a little smaller, and it and it is, um, but it's more around making some use cases a little less hacky. Um, so the way I like to think of these is uh, as bookend tasks or support tasks. Um, but at the end of the day, they're they're basically normal tasks with some special properties, which we'll we'll go through. So let's imagine that we have a uh, the simple DAG, right? Want to create a cluster? We want to run a query and then delete it. Um, if we look at the happy path, everything's good. It's not that interesting. But once we get off the happy path, is where it gets more fun. So first, let's create this or just transition this DAG to use the setup and teardown concept. Um, so the only difference in this authoring style is we, add, we did the as teardown method on that delete cluster task, and we marked the create cluster as its setup. Feels a little weird, but this defines that scope. This is the, the bookend part of the, of the analogy. Um, and the graph that we get is, it looks like this, right? So we have the create task and the run task, then delete. And then we also have that dotted line at the bottom. That's the scope. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the properties that setup teardown allows. So your teardown will always run no matter what the scope ends up being, right? So in this case, run query failed, but our setup succeeded. And so we're going to run teardown anyway, easy enough. And we didn't have to do any shenanigans with trigger rules. Like you could do this earlier, but then it gets into like weird, like do you do all done, all failed? Like, yeah, just easy out of the box. Dag run state. By default, if your teardown fails, your dag run doesn't fail. And then clearing. In this case, we're just clearing run query. No, we don't have upstream or downstream set but we end up getting all three of our tests. That's because it will clear any setup and teardowns that are in scope for the task that you're trying to clear. And this is, this, is the, this is probably the coolest part of setup and teardown, depending on your perspective. Making it'll, I, mean, I guess, said another way, Airflow will make sure that your setup and teardowns for that task that you're clearing run at the same time. Cool. So. Setup and teardown is, a, the, I guess, a property of being more or less normal tasks. Let you, it, it means that there's more than one way to author these DAGs. Um, so we saw the one style. I like this style myself. Um, and so there's setup and teardown decorators. This is essentially a task flow decorator, um, but it makes the, it, it marks it as a setup and teardown task as well. And then the scope is defined with this context manager. Um, so this will not only make it very clear what tasks are in scope of that setup and teardown, but it also defines that relationship that you need between them. Um, I threw this in as a, as a little nugget. Uh, you can also do setup and teardowns in parallel. Um, the docs on this feature are pretty comprehensive. Um, so yeah, definitely go out and play with them. It's a new feature. If you find bugs, please report them to us. Um, cool. Params. So params have actually been around for a while now. I think they, I think they were even in Airflow 2.0, if I'm not mistaken, but they've evolved over time. Um, and so kind of the, the short version is params give you a way to get input into your DAG run. Oh, I missed a bullet point. JSON schema is kind of what, what's under the hood. Okay, so let's look at this param. Let's say I need to inject a rounds variable into my DAG run. Um, 
I can have a, a default, which is really helpful because you need to have a default for scheduled runs. Otherwise, there's no user to like tell you how many runs you need, right? Or rounds, rather. And so in this case, you know, default five, I need at least three, and I want it to be an integer. And then Airflow, very helpfully, will give me this interface when I go to trigger the DAG run with conf. It'll make sure that we're three or more and an integer. How do we use params and DAGs? Easy enough, it's just in context. So just like any other context variable, they're there for you to use. Now, one word of caution, you are dealing with user input, so it's on you to make sure that you're not doing bad things with user input. Uh, a good example of doing bad things with user input is bash command. Um, so in this case, it's the bash command part of the bash operator is not escaped by default, and so the safe way to do it is with M's and then have proper quoting. But this isn't specific to bash operator, this is just an example, right? Remember you're dealing with user input, treat it with care. Cool, okay, so since we're based on JSON schema, there's some other interesting things we can do. We can control the title and the description pretty easily. We can also force enums and the title and the enum. Easy enough, right? Cool. All right, my last, uh, my last call to action here. Um, I think uh, the panel this morning hammered it home pretty well, but over 2,600 folks just like you built Airflow into what it is today. You can help us shape it going forward. All con contributions are valid. Caxel said his first PR was a typo, so have at it. Uh, I sit in this development uh, first PR support channel on Slack. If you need help, reach out. There are folks that love helping people get started. And I don't know if we have enough time for questions. Um, uh, just one question for a specific scenario about data sets. So for example, you have a list of DAGs that need to run, you know, depending on each other on the output data set uh, for time series data. Let's say how you actually manage uh, the data set in a way that, okay, the DAG will know, okay, which data set to look for in which time series and then uh, and then, up, and then update the corresponding data set in your corresponding time series range. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was around uh, do data sets support like any time series concepts or anything? And the answer today is no. Um, that That is a very requested feature um, and I'd imagine it's something that we'll be looking at soon. Um, now, that doesn't mean, again, it's just a string, right? And so if you wanted to come up with your own, um, you know, pattern to to do that you could because you can also like list the data sets that are available in airflow um, so you could build your own system to make it work um, if you needed it today the the question was uh, can airflow support multiple data sets uh, both on the consuming and producing side um, on the producing side yes and in more than one way yes um, because you basically you you put it on the outlet of the task and so you can do more than one data set in a task, and then you can also have more than one task that updates different data sets in your DAG, right? And then on the consuming side, um, there was that, that slide that we showed that explained that um, you need an update in every data set for the DAG run to be triggered. So yes, on that front as well. Thank you very much, Sanjay, for, for the presentation. Thank you, guys.